Hey everybody, welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crip review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostess, and today's episode is season five, episode two, As Ye Sow. Or if you're a farmer, As Ye Sow. Get it? Pigs. Anyway, as always, John Kassir does the voice of the Crip Keeper and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode aired October 2nd, 1993. It was directed by Kyle McLaughlin. That's right, the Kyle McLaughlin from shows like Twin Peaks and Portlandia. And he was also in an episode He was uh, of Tales from the Crypt. He was in season three, episode two, Carrion Death. But he directed this episode. I'm not sure why, because it's the only thing he's ever directed. Uh, the screenplay for this episode is by Rotten Finley. This episode stars Hector Alonso from movies like Pretty Woman, Patsy Kinsett from movies like Lethal Weapon 2 and TV's Holby City, John Shea, who's also from TV's Gossip Girl, Adam West, who is TV's Batman, it's Batman, Adam West is in this, and Sam Watterson from TV's Law & Order. I'm going to go ahead here and read the description on the back of the box for As You Sow. Let us pray. That's P-R-E-Y. A jealous hubby thinks his wife's dutiful church-going means she's having a fling with a priest. Ooh, more adultery stuff. We'll just see how this one plays out. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started on the episode here. So this one opens up. The Crib Keeper is hosting a radio show. The letters for it is K-D-O-A, which D-O-A is dead on arrival. So ha ha ha. But he's got a like a little sweater and a button-up shirt and... He's bringing in the episode and, you know, puns and all stuff. He's got the book out in front of him. He's got a cigarette, smoking a cigarette. It's just one of those late night talk shows and everything. So that's how he brings in the episode for this one. So this episode opens up where there's a woman, Patsy Kinsett, who is playing a woman named Bridget. She's being watched. So all you see is her being filmed from like a camera point of view. Obviously, someone's taping her to get information about her. What you'll find out is that her husband, played by Hector Alonso, has hired a private investigator to check out what she's doing. Um, so he's paid like $30,000 for this. And so he's talking to Adam West, who is part of the private investigation. They're in an office. And Hector Alonso, or Leo, his name is Leo Burns in this, is upset because he's like, well, if I was paying you $30,000, I should get more than just a home video of my wife walking around. And Adam West, who is playing, his name is Chapman, is like, well, if she was doing anything worth recording, then we'd find it. Here she is, exiting the produce market. I got eyes for Christ's sake. How'd you guys know she didn't go out in the back for a quickie? I had a man in back and another one inside the store. Three guys, that's it. Three is all the FBI would use. Here she stops briefly at the butcher's. And her daily 10 o'clock visit to St. Xavier's. I paid you guys 30 grand for this shit. Home movies of my wife going in and out of stores and church. I told you when we undertook this job that it would be expensive, that we might come up with nothing, particularly if your wife is up to nothing. Face it, Mr. Burns. Your wife is a regular choir girl. Just because you couldn't catch her at it doesn't mean she isn't doing it. I know she's up to some shit. Leo is very suspicious. It looks like already that, you know, maybe Bridget's not really, she's not that bad of a wife. She is quite a bit younger than uh, Leo. You find out that she's about 24 years younger than him. One reason why he is worried that maybe she's fooling around on him because of the age thing. And, and so he's sitting here talking to Adam West in this office. And Adam West is in a nice suit and got the real thick kind of glasses and stuff. And he has a nice voice, Adam West. I, I like his voice. And what we find in this episode, or at least I find like Hector Alonso playing Leo. Leo has quite an imagination and we'll see that as it goes on here in this episode. Um, he, his paranoia fuels such a big imagination where you're like, wow, okay. So right now they're in the office and they're talking and there's kind of a close up here of Leo's face and he's looking really pale and just, I don't know if that was like supposed to happen or, or just bad makeup, but he looks awfully pale to me, but maybe it's also trying to imply that he hasn't been sleeping or something like that. So he's just really worn out. I mean, he still looks nice though. So he's in like a suit and stuff, but he's struggling because he, he knows in his heart, in his mind that she's fooling around on him or doing something and he's going to get to the bottom of it. So he heads over to meet another private detective. I'm pretty sure he's another private detective. Let's see. 
Yeah. And now this place, it immediately, it's got me worried. And Leo should be too. So he's he goes to go see Sam Watterson, and Sam is playing Gigi DeVoe, who is another private investigator. But this place is suspicious. It's in like this old warehouse, and it's just everything is abandoned. There's no other people working in this building. There's just some filing cabinets and a desk in the very back of the building with the light on it. Like it's very kind of noir kind of thing, a detective stereotype kind of thing, but there's no one else there. And so for some reason, Leo's like completely cool with that. You know, those other guys were supposed to be the best in town. How do I know you're any good? You wouldn't go to an optometrist to get your kidney stones removed, would you? What kidney stones? I'm making a point. You went to a man whose expertise is in insurance fraud, embezzling, that sort of thing. And for this, Chapman is very good. I'd go to him. But infidelity is another kettle of fish. And what Gigi DeVoe is saying is basically the guy you went to previously, Adam West's character, Chapman, is more into like embezzling and fraud and stuff. He's like, me, I'm into infidelity. Like, I can find this out. I'll figure it out. If she's doing this, I'll find it. And so he's like, sweet, that's what I want. And Sam Watterson's looking pretty sharp in his outfit. He's like a nice three-piece suit. He looks the part. It's just the rest of this building does not look at all trustworthy. He's like, when did you think she was first you know, having an affair and he starts to tell him because now he's kind of like, Leo's kind of frustrated because now it's talking about like feelings and stuff, I think. So he gets up and starts pacing around the room and he's looking out the window and he starts talking about how they don't, they aren't intimate anymore. And then he's real gross. Gigi DeVoe asks if she wears full or pleated skirts or stretch pants that just slip over the hip. And he's like, does she prefer garter belts to pantyhose? And he's like, what are you talking about? And so basically what he says, Sam Watterson's character is like, you know, it's easy access clothing. Does your wife wear easy access clothing? What? Does she wear full or pleated skirts? Stretch pants that just slip over the hips? Does she prefer garter belts to pantyhose? I don't know. You're in the dry cleaning business and you don't notice your wife's clothing. I know about clothing. I don't know about that. What are you trying to tell me? All I'm saying is you ought to think about these things. Mr. Byrne, I don't know yet if your wife is having an affair or not. But we do have a saying in this business. If you're not getting it, someone else is. And I was like, oh, you know, that's what he's trying to hint at, which as an investigator, I guess that's a good point. But just like the look he gives him with that is just kind of creepy. So he's definitely setting up Leo's paranoia even more and being like, yes, I totally believe you because Chapman, played by Adam West, was like, this is probably not probable. And this guy's just like, yeah, I'm going to make you so paranoid. So now it's back at their house, Leo and Bridget's house, and he's going through her underwear and looking through her slips and seeing if she is a garter belt type of girl or pantyhose type of girl. And he's like looking at her bras and she's walking in and she's like, what are you doing? And he notices that one of her slips or like body suits, um, buckles or unclips on the bottom near the crotch area. And he's like, what's this about? You know, like, what is going on? Why would you have this easy access clothing? And she's like, so I can go to the bathroom? And that's what that's for. You, If you have a bodysuit thing, how else are you going to go to the bathroom? They unclip in the bottom. So yeah, his paranoia is slowly getting up there. He, and he really does, it seems like he is, he does care about his wife. And he also understands about his insecurities with it. And he's trying to get her in the mood here. And she's just like, no, not right now. I don't want to, you know, and she's like, no. And he's kind of like, not really forcing her, but kind of putting the pressure on a little bit, which is an odd time to do it when you just got done like rooting through her underwear and trying to be suspicious over why she wears what she wears. And then be like, hey, baby, you want to do this? And she's like, oh, no. And you're like, oh, shock. So now he goes back to Gigi DeVoe's office. And now it's definitely the stereotype of like the old detectives. He's got, he's sitting there in his suit at the desk and it's barely lit. And he's got the um, Chinese food that he's eating with chopsticks. And it's like all the, the containers of takeout and the white little boxes. And it's just like, he's been working hard, you know, just like slaving away over all this to get the stuff for um, Leo. And so he's got these pictures for him and he's looking through it. And it's pretty much the same stuff. It's the same stuff Chapman got. 
But he's like, now take a look at the last two again. Look at it carefully. And what they're seeing is that she goes into the church, whatever church is nearby. She goes into the church, which is like a, a Catholic church. And when she comes out, she looks happier every time she comes out of this church. So Gigi DeVoe is like, she's doing something with someone in the church. That's what's going on. Leo's like, well, I mean, she's probably doing confession and all that stuff. She's religious, you know, like apparently she's Irish. She's from Ireland. They're very Catholic. He shows him a picture of this priest and Father John Sajak, who is played by John Shea. And so there's two pictures of both of them. And so now he's he's suspicious, even though he really has no reason to be. But he's like, are you seriously suggesting she's banging a priest? You know, <laughs> and he's like, well, yeah, tells him all about him. Like I said, Father John Sajak. He's like, he was fired from his last position for disobeying um, the Pope's uh, ruling on contraception. He is already kind of like, I guess, a bad boy in the church stuff kind of thing. So, yeah. So now he's even more paranoid. He still doesn't really have any reason to be. Basically, she's going to church. She comes out happier. There's a priest there who's kind of younger, more her age. And Leo and Bridget aren't banging. So obvious to him that they're having an affair. So now his imagination is really starting to run wild and they start showing these scenes where like the pictures get changed in his mind. Like they're not really changed, but like he's looking at these pictures of her and the father and his, the father, John Sajak's face changes to like the smirk. And then her face changes to like this, like shot of like ecstasy with her head back, but then it goes back to normal. So it's like, he's already starting, he's seeing things that aren't there. So now Leo goes to this church. So he shows up at this church. He's like, hey, can I talk to Father Sajak? This person's like, yeah, he's in the choir loft. Go check it out because he's talking to some guy that works there. So he goes up to the choir loft and the father, Father John, is playing the organ. It's a nice church, a big church. Not a whole lot of stained glass or anything, but a nice big uh, choir pit up there above the whole, all the pews and stuff. Like You can look down at it. And so he's up there just playing the organ and he's real friendly and nice. And Can I help you? Yeah. yeah, I just moved into the neighborhood. I thought I'd check out your parish for my wife and me and the kids. Ah, family man. That's nice to hear that. Mr. Leo. Leone. I'm John Sajak. Father, why is it nice to hear that? Well, we have a lot of overstressed young professionals here in the flock, and unstable relationships and all the issues that are connected to that are part of the inevitability I have to deal with. It's it's just nice roll, roll, roll that back a minute. What issues? Well, premarital sex, marital infidelity, contraception, abortion, divorce, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, when I grew up, that kind of shit, that stuff, was immoral, pure and simple. And another thing to remember here is that Leo and Bridget don't have kids, so they're just... He's lying about a lot of it. And so he's like, well, what's your name? And he's like, Leo... Leone. And I'm like, really? That's the name you're going to go for? But Father John is trying to be a little more open-minded and knowing that people, you know, make mistakes and things and trying to re reestablish the Catholic Church in a different way. But he's a really nice guy, or at least he seems really friendly and personable. And Leo is not buying it. He's just silent and taking into account too much of what Father John says to be malicious. Leo's up still up there in the choir loft and he's looking down and he sees that Father John is welcoming some woman into the chambers to to do um to do confession, like the booth, you know, where they split it in two. And you got the one on the one side and one on the other, and there's like the screen or whatever. And I think Leo thinks it's Bridget. It's a woman who's, you know, she's just got like a skirt, like a like a long dress on, and a, her hair is has a um like a bandana thing around it or whatever. Similar too to what my great grandmother used to wear. It was like a she was Polish, so she had like a babushka covering thing, kind of like that. So I think it might have been maybe it was raining. Sometimes they wear it when it rains too. So Leo's running down there like, whoa, what's going on? And he sees them both go into the booth, and immediately he's suspicious. He thinks something's going on down there, and he's hearing things that aren't happening. I guess it is. It, maybe it is Bridget. Yeah. And I don't think this is what she's saying, obviously. Like, it's not what she's saying. But what he hears, because he's near it and hearing it, the father is like, you know, what are your sins? And then she's all like, I've been having impure thoughts. I'm a wicked whore. And just like, she literally says wicked whore. And he's just listening to it like, yeah, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like standing next to the Virgin Mary statue, just, I knew it. And then he's picturing the father coming up behind her and just all the things that they're going to be doing in this confessional booth. And 
yeah, it's it's really making his blood boil. And then there's a scene where, you know, they're they're going at it in the confessional booth and all that. It's sacrilegious there. And then uh, Leo can't handle it because now he's that's all he sees is that's what they're doing. He's like, I can't I can't handle it. And he just comes bursting out of the church and he's like, OK, I'm going to get this guy because now he's convinced for no reason that this man is sleeping around with his wife, which I guess maybe that woman was her. I don't know. I mean, I'm a, I don't know, I guess. But he thinks she's a wicked whore, I guess. So he goes back to Gigi DeVos. There's always like these cliche sounds of the subway and traffic and things in the background when he goes to see this. And there's like a slow fan just slowly turning. And so he goes back to Gigi and he's like, okay, you're right. This guy is having an affair with my wife. I want to take him out. So we need to hire a hitman. So he's like, cool. So he hires a hitman for $100,000. How much? A fraction of what the divorce would cost. $50,000 for the people. You got it. And another fifty for me, all in advance, and to be left in a place of my choosing. In advance? What, I look like a moron or something? But Gigi's like, after you leave this building tonight, I'm hiring the hitman. You know, forget all about this ever happened, and eventually this this hit will, will go out. And Leo's like, well, like, you know, when? When will it happen? He's like, Gigi's like, well, maybe a week, a month, but you're, it's going to happen but you don't need to know much. So they're trying to keep it to where Leo's going to be more behind the scenes so he can't get caught. So he goes to, where are they at? It's at a locker where he's taken, okay, it's at a bus platform, bus station thing. And he's putting a bag of money in this locker. And that's what Gigi DeVoe's going to pick up because he had to go get the money. So he's got it in cash and put it in a bag, which these never go well anyway, either. I don't think I've ever really seen a, a thing where that went well in like a transaction. The only time I remember it really working out was in Rat Race, but even then, everyone, like in the remake of Rat Race, everyone was almost beaten to death half the time they got there. But uh, actually, the money might not even have been in there when they got there. I'll have to watch that movie again. But yeah, it doesn't work out. And so then he puts the key in a little envelope, and he mails the little envelope. So then Gigi, I guess, will get this, or the hitman, or whoever will get this. And so now it cuts back to the church. And I guess it's just been it's just been some time later. I don't think it's been that long. They don't really say. But he's just supposed to go on his own business like nothing's going on, right? But Leo's feeling pretty good. He's out there eating a sandwich in the car by the church. I, I don't know. I guess he thinks it's going to happen or he knows when just to just relax. But he's outside the church just happy and eating a sandwich. And what's funny is he looks across the street or they show you across the street and there's always like, you know, like or like at a church, there's always like the times of the church when they have a service and then they'll have like a phrase or something sometimes they're on a bulletin board time thing. So this one says, it's okay to be you. So that's what that one says. Keep this in mind because it, it does change later. So it cuts back later that night after he's paid the money. There he's uh, Bridget's getting into bed. Gosh, their blankets and their drapes match their wallpaper. Ew, it's like these flowery gray and red roses thing. Oh. Why is it all so matchy? Anyway, so he, they're laying there and he just try, he's trying to act like it doesn't bother him anymore. Bridget's laying down in bed and there's, the pillows are like a banana pudding yellow. I don't know. I don't know who picked this stuff for this house. But he's saying that he's sorry. He's sorry about how he's been acting. And so he rolls over to start like kissing on her. Barely even starts to kiss on her, really. And she's just like, no, I'm tired. Get away. So he's immediately cutting to the scenes of how he thought they were getting it on in the confession booth. And so now he's just like irritated again, but he's, he still looks like he's just staring off into space. But he's like, of course, she doesn't want this because she's cheating on me. This guy's got to die soon. So now it's some time later and we're back in front of the church. And this time the sign on the church says, in quotes, the church as a living, potent organ, which is what Father Sajak was saying earlier. That's what he wants the church to be. And now when he's sitting there in the car, he thinks, he see, he looks over and he looks at the bulletin board on the outside there. And now he thinks he sees what Gigi DeVoe was saying to him, which is, if you ain't getting it, someone else is. 10 a.m. service. Like, that's the name of the service this time. He's going to speak about, if you ain't getting it, someone else is. His paranoia is quite imaginative. It's very strong. He's hallucinating, basically. And then it goes back to normal, to easing the flack out of a stressed out flock. That's what it actually says, not what he saw. So he's in his car like, what is wrong with me? <sighs> this hit needs to go down soon. And he's picturing like in the back of his car that Bridget and Father John are making out. It's just really driving him crazy. He can't handle it. Because it seems kind of weird. Like he gets mad in front of the church. He goes back to the house to yell at Bridget. Bridget's terrified that he's going to like hit her or something. He just won't ask her, I guess, that she's having an affair. He doesn't seem to be bringing that up. 
but he's frustrated because his hit hasn't happened yet. And he just wants it to happen. So he's like, you know what? I can't deal with this. I can't. I can't. So he immediately comes home and leaves. He goes back to Gigi DeVoe's warehouse. Surprise, surprise, nothing's there. You know, he feels like he's been conned by this PI, by this private investigator. There's just the desk there. It has the knife in it that um, Leo stuck in it when they made the deal and nothing else. And so now he's pissed. So he takes off running back to the bus depot and he goes to open the locker and the locker's left open as if like kind of a sign like, ha ha ha, we got you. I, I think he's thinking he should just take care of this guy himself. I don't know. But he goes back to the church. I guess he wants to see it so that he knows it happened, which is kind of stupid because then you're going to get caught. Yeah, he wants to take care of it himself. At first, I would think like if the money's gone, this hitman's going to happen pretty soon. But since no one ever tells anyone every, anything in this stuff, in these ty- ty- type of shows, Leo thinks that he pretty much got screwed. So he thinks the money's gone. Gigi DeVoe is gone, which I think Gigi DeVoe is just gone because it's it's a tricky business. You can't just set up wherever. That's why the warehouse was like it was. Leo thinks that this hit's not going to go down. He thinks he just got played for $100,000. So he takes that knife that was back in the warehouse and he heads over to the church and he's heading into one of the confessional booths and he climbs into the one that's for the priest. So he's just sitting there holding the knife and waiting for someone to come in. I don't know if he's waiting for the father to come in there so he can take care of it, but just so happens that Bridget is there. She's here a lot to confess. She's just like living in the church. Just so happens that she he's there. So then she's like, hey, father, what's up? And so he's got to kind of hide, you know, with it. So he throws the collar on over his neck so he can blend in. Even though I don't think they normally look at you. They just open the side of the screen and then like you're not supposed to see each other, you know, because it's a confession. So he's like, hey, girl, or, you know, whatever, my child, tell me your sins. And so she's like, I have sinned. And he's like, cool, she's going to tell me all about this. I've been a bad, no, no, I've been a terrible wife, a liar who has caused my husband too much suffering. (sighs) What did you lie about? The reasons why I don't perform the duties of a wife more often. Why didn't you do that? I've wanted to tell him, Father, so many times, but I was afraid he wouldn't understand. You see, my mother died giving birth, and I'm so afraid it would happen to me if ever I got pregnant. I just... Wait. Wait wait a minute. Is that it? Yes. Truly penitent in me heart, and I'm ready to make an act of contrition if only you can grant me absolution. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. Leo? Oh, Bridge. Is that, is that you? It's me, Bridge. Bridge, come on, get out of there. And so she's upset. She's, she says that she's been a bad wife. She feels like a terrible wife, that she knows her husband is suffering. And she's like, okay, the reason I don't do the duties of a wife more often, you know, she doesn't say it out loud, but, you know, the sex. Because see, apparently they've been trying to have a baby or they want to have a baby. But then she's also, she's really terrified. I don't know why she couldn't just go on birth control if this is what she really wanted, but she probably should talk to him about it anyway. People should talk to each other. That's what I learn a lot of these shows on. Just talk. And she's upset because she's a good Catholic. And I guess that's probably why she's not on the contraception. She wants to have a baby with him. The problem is her mother passed away during childbirth, and she is absolutely terrified that that's going to happen if she gets pregnant. But she feels like a horrible, I guess, Catholic wife because she's not sleeping with her husband and doing what she's supposed to do and, again, not talking about what her problems are. Leo immediately is, feels so bad and like sad. He's like, you didn't cheat? And then that's when his face shows up, and he's like almost in tears, like, you didn't cheat on me? And she's like... Leo, what are you doing here? (laughs) Why are you in the other booth? What's happening? And so she comes out and she's like, oh my God, Leo, instead of being upset that he was being sneaky, she's so easy to forgive him. Like, she's not like, what the hell are you doing in there? She's like, oh my God, Leo, what? And then he's like, oh, sweetie, I'm so happy. And she's like, why were you in there? And he's like, it doesn't matter. Shh, shh, you know, it's it's fine. Don't worry about it. I didn't put a hit out on your whatever lover. And he feels much better and they're hugging and he's all excited. And she's hugging them. They're all happy. And just at this time, a man stands next to them in the church and he's got a gun. And this man is the hitman. And it's played by Miguel Ferrer. 
who was in an, another episode, I think The Thing from the Grave. And then he, I mean, he's been in a lot of stuff. Twin Peaks, too. Yeah, he was in Twin Peaks. But he's standing there in a black hat and a black, completely black outfit with gloves and a gun. And he's pointing it straight at Bridget and Leo. And he's a very sloppy hitman. Leo's like, oh, wait, I know what this is. My bad. And see, he's still wearing that collar that makes him look like a priest. And he takes that off. And see, that's what, like, that. I don't know why he had to put that on, but he put it on. And so since because he has that on, Miguel Ferrer thinks, you know, this is the guy. This is the guy I'm supposed to kill. I was told to kill the priest. He had his hands on Bridget, so it looks like they were a couple or whatever. He's like, okay. And so Leo's like, no, seriously. He takes the collar off. He's like, hey, I hired you. My bad. And he doesn't even hesitate. The hitman hits up, like, shoots him in the chest and then comes up, walks up to him and shoots him, like, in the head and just kills him right in front of her. And she's got, and Bridget's watching with her rosary and she's like, oh my God, Leo. Or, like, I guess he hits her and hits him in the head. I don't know, his eyes are still, well, now he's dead. But he was there moving for a second, so he's dead. So Leo gets hit by his own hitman because for some reason he put the collar on. But mostly because he was being paranoid. And then Father John Sajak comes out of nowhere and he's like, oh my god, what, is that a gunshot? And then it pans out and Leo's dead. That's the end of the episode. Leo gets hit by the hitman. He paid $100,000 to die. That was basically what happened. And then it jumps back to the Crypt Keeper. He's still on the air, uh, the radio station, and just bringing in them puns. <laughs> Crypt Keeper, you're so punny. And the best Crypt Keeper pun is... As for me, kiddies, my shift's up. It's the top of the hour. Time for your favorite morning man. <laughs> What's the matter? You've never seen a shock jock before? <laughs> and he's still on the radio, and it's funny because he's just, he's on the radio, it's on the air, and the microphone's like all kind of screwed up, and so he sticks his finger in it and electrocutes himself, and when he, he gets shocked, he turns into a skeletal version of Howard Stern. So he's got sunglasses on and long black hair and like a tie-dye shirt. And there's a, a skeleton lady with no hair with giant breasts sitting there. And he's just like, you know, he becomes like a shock jock. Get it? You know, because he gets electrocuted. Oh, so many puns. And yeah, so that's the end of season five, episode two, as you sow. There is some trivia here from IMDb. The title is based on the quote for as you sow, you are like to reap, which is from a Samuel Butler um, who was alive 1612 to 1680 one of his poems that acquired some biblical inspiration from the book of Galatians, which is also in quotes, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, which has to do a lot with this episode anyway. I mean, because he was sowing paranoia and, and anger and things, and he was setting himself up for something bad because he wasn't, he was letting to get away from him. So he, since that's what he sowed, that's what he reaps, and now he's dead. So, the next episode is Season 5, Episode 3, Forever Ambergris. Thank you all so much for downloading and subscribing and, and checking out the podcast and telling your friends and things like that. If you want to send an email to the podcast, that's at goodeveningpod at gmail.com with any questions or comments. There's a Facebook page you can follow. There's also a Twitter page you can follow. That's at G-E-K podcast or at GEC podcast. Please leave a five-star review on iTunes or I guess as an Apple podcast now, I don't know, that or on um, Podbean. Uh, so yeah, just thanks so much for your support and have a good one. I just had quite a scare. I actually thought my heart was beating again. Hey there, this is JB. And if you enjoy Tales from the Crypt, then check out my show, Tales from the Podcast, where myself, and usually a very special guest, sit down to discuss the TV show, the films, the animated series, as well as the original comics. So check me out every other week on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and of course, at TalesFromThePodcast.com. Thanks for listening, kiddies. You're all a scream. <laughs>